Hi everyone, and today we're going to be talking all about proteins. So proteins are just like carbohydrates and fats made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. The only difference is proteins have the addition of nitrogen, and sometimes they also have the addition of sulfur. Now proteins are chains of amino acids, and those chains can be every, anywhere from 30 to in the 30,000 range. And those amino acids get bound together by dehydration synthesis. And they form these special bonds between the amino acids. And those bonds are called peptide bonds. Now about 40% of your body is made up of proteins. So it's a significant amount and they're very important to a lot of the different things that we need to do in our bodies and with our bodies. Let's take a look at an amino acid to start off. Now, amino acids have three parts. The first part of the amino acid is the amino end. Now the amino end, you'll either see it appear as NH2 or you'll see it appear as NH3+. The second group is the carboxyl group. Now you should remember these two groups from our discussion of basic chemistry. The carboxyl group will either appear as COO negative, as it does here, or it will appear as COOH. The third group that you'll need to recognize is the R group. Now what R means is it just means there are 20 different variations of other things that will be attached to this carbon. So you'll notice that the carbon can attach to four things. Here's the amino group that it's attached to and then it's bound to the carboxyl group. It's also always attached to a hydrogen group and then the last thing that it will be attached to is the R group. So again, here are your structures. The amino group, the carboxyl group, here's that hydrogen, and then there's going to be 20 different types of R groups that will be able to attach to this structure. So because there are 20 different R groups, that means there are 20 different amino acids. Let's take a look at these amino acids this amino acid is valine and you'll notice there's its amino group, its carboxyl group, its hydrogen group and so everything else that's left over will be its R group. This is the R group for valine. Let's take a look at isoleucine. Here's isoleucine's amino group, carboxyl group, hydrogen group and the R group for this particular amino acid is all of this stuff. I'm not going to go through all of them. You don't need to memorize all of them. You just need to recognize that these are all amino acids. Amino acids are bound together by dehydration synthesis and when they do that, because it's dehydration synthesis, they lose a water. And when they lose a water, they're forming a peptide bond. So you see here's the peptide bond between the carbon of one amino acid. Here's that carbon here from the carboxyl group. And the nitrogen from the other amino acid. Here's the nitrogen here from the NH group. That is a peptide bond. Now if you take two amino acids together, what you've done essentially is created a dipeptide. Whenever you see the word peptide, think protein. They both start with P, peptides are proteins. So here, because you've got one amino acid with the first R group attached to another amino acid, then this structure with two amino acids is called a dipeptide held together with a peptide bond. If you then take three amino acids, here's one, here's two, and three, then you've made a tripeptide because there are three amino acids held together with a peptide bond. Now of course proteins are much larger than just three amino acids. There are another name for protein is a polypeptide or many amino acids held together with a peptide bond and like I said that can be anywhere from 30 amino acids to 30,000 amino acids depending on how long that protein chain needs to be to do its job. Here's your first amino acid. There's the amino group, carboxyl group, and of course the R group. If you take another amino acid with the same formations, the amino group of one is going to form a bond to the carboxyl group of another. That peptide bond involves losing one water molecule. So we call that dehydration synthesis. 
Every protein is different and the reason that the proteins are different from each other is because of the, the order of amino acids. Let's say we had phenylalanine attached to lysine, attached to isoleucine, attached to valine, etc. And those amino acids are in a very specific order. The reason that that order matters is because each of these amino acids have a different R group. And some of the R groups are positive, some of them are negative, some of them have sulfur groups. Most of them are just neutral. They don't have any significant impact on the shape of a protein. But what a protein change is going to do is if one amino acid has a positive and the other one has a negative, the chain will actually kink in order that that positive and negative can get together because they're attracted to each other. And if you have two sulfurs in a chain, let's pretend that these two were both sulfurs, then again that chain will kink in order to let those sulfurs get together to form a sulfur bridge. So the order that these amino acids are in will be important because of what their R groups are doing. And their R groups will determine how that protein chain ultimately kinks and twists and the shape of the final protein will give the protein its job or its function. It will allow it to do its job properly in the cell. So there's four different levels of protein structure. The first level is called primary structure. A one with a degree sign represents the primary structure. And primary structure is just what we've been talking about so far. It's what gets shot out of the ribosome when the ribosome is finished copying the mRNA into a chain of amino acids. Those amino acids are held together with peptide bonds. So it's simply just this really straight line of amino acids strung together. Okay? And if you change the order of these amino acids, then that will impact its ability to do its job properly. The secondary structure, once that protein leaves the ribosome, it's going to start to twist and kink up. Two with a degree sign represents the secondary structure, basically the second thing that happens to a protein. So what the protein is going to do is it's going to start twisting into one of two shapes. This is an alpha helix. So the symbol here means alpha, and this is a beta leaded sheet. You can see almost like an accordion. And what happens with secondary structure is that when the NH group and the COO group bond to form that, that peptide bond, you'll get some charges forming. So the carboxyl group becomes negative the amino group becomes positive. Now what this does is it creates a positive negative interaction in the chain. It's like water, they're going to want to get together and form a hydrogen bond. So when you've got some positive NH groups and some negative EOO groups from each amino acid, you'll get this twisting of the chain so hydrogen bonds can form and you'll get this twisting and all of these kinks are caused by hydrogen bonds between um, every third or fourth amino acid. That would make an alpha helix. So basically the chain will twist into either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet and that's the secondary structure. Here you can see the alpha helix and here you can see the beta pleated sheet. Next level or the next thing that happens to a protein is the tertiary structure symbol right there. So you can see within this picture you can see those alpha helix and what happens to those formations next is you'll start getting some interactions between the R groups and some R groups are reactive like I said some R groups are positive some are negative and some are sulfurs so the sulfurs of one R group want together to get together with the sulfurs from another R group to make a sulfur bridge and the positives and negatives want to get together because opposites attract and also you get the chain kinking away from each other. If you get two positives close to each other, it'll, they'll try to get as far away from each other as possible. And same goes for two negatives. They want to get as far away from each other as possible. Don't want to be anywhere near each other. So you'll get some interactions between the positives and negatives and the sulfur sulfurs. And what those interactions do is they build a very specific three-dimensional shape. Now this is a specific three-dimensional shape. It doesn't look very specific. It looks just kind of like a twisted up blob, but it's actually got a very specific shape to it and its shape will determine how well 
it's able to do its job in the body. Let's talk about some of those amino acids then. You'll notice here's the NH group, carboxyl group, hydrogen group. Okay, so I'm just going to show that as being the consistent part of every amino acid. And then we'll take a look at the R groups. If you look at the R groups of aspartic acid, you'll notice that aspartic acid is negative. If let's look at glutamic acid. Glutamic acid is also negative. If you look at histidine, you'll notice that there's a positive charge on histidine. Lysine is the same and arginine is the same. Okay, so you've got two amino acids out of the 20 that are negative and three that are positive. If you look at methionine and cysteine, you'll notice both of their R groups have a sulfur in them. So if you've got a protein with two methionines, two cysteines, or one methionine and one cysteine, they're always going to try to bend toward each other to form a bridge. That isn't very many amino acids that actually have reactive R groups. All of the other ones, all the way from glycine, the simplest one, alanine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, isoleucine, all of these are neutral. They don't have any charges or any sulfur groups, so they won't affect how that protein change bends in the tertiary structure. Now, the last level of protein structure is the quaternary structure, and it's not, it's not seen in all proteins, just in some. And what happens is you'll see this color of this protein is different from this color, and that's because once the three-dimensional structures of the proteins bind together, and they're very specific shapes, and they sometimes will join up with other proteins to form in an ionic bond. And what that will do is that will form end result or the functional protein. So if you look at insulin, insulin actually has two proteins bound together just like you see in this picture. And hemoglobin has four. These are two examples that you need to know because they are examples of quaternary structure. This is what hemoglobin looks like in the cartoon version. You'll see one, two, three, four protein blobs joined together to help hemoglobin do its job. And here's insulin with one, two, the blue and the green blobs. So those are both examples of quaternary structure. If we look at the whole process from primary to quaternary then, primary structure is just amino acids joined together with a peptide bond and then it starts to twist into an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet because of hydrogen bonds between the NH and the COO groups that are now charged and then those R groups get into the action and they form either positive negative interactions or sulfur sulfur interactions and then finally sometimes these three-dimensional proteins will bind together ionically in order for the protein to do its job.